Okay, why don't we get started? I know there's lots of people still joining. Um, well, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the Implementing ESGM Best Practice Guidance and Lessons Learned from the Field webinar. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Brenner. I'm the Principal Product Success Manager for ESGM at ServiceNow. And I'm joined by my colleague uh, today, Freedom David, who's the Principal Business Process Consultant from Customer Outcome for Risk and ESG Products. Uh, quickly, before we get into the webinar content itself, just want to post a safe harbor notice in case uh, any discussions around roadmap um, or future looking uh, items to be delivered are, are brought up. Uh, so just want to cover that off. Um, and today, here's our agenda. And in addition to this, I just want to mention for any Q&A, please use the Q&A function within the webinar. Uh, myself and Freedom will do our best to respond to those questions. Uh, in real time and or uh, toward the end of the session. Um, and if there's things we can't get to, we'll be sure to uh, post those questions as part of our, our wrap up with the recording and uh, PowerPoint that we'll put into the community and other uh, ServiceNow uh, locations. So our agenda today is a quick welcome and introduction for myself and Freedom. Uh, then we're gonna talk about why our organizations, uh, um, why are they focused on ESG today? Uh, especially with what's going on in the regulatory market in different parts of the world. Uh, then we're going to look at an overview of ESGM, the product, uh, the ServiceNow solution to help organizations meet those challenges. Uh, and then we're going to talk about lessons learned. So we'll contextualize some of the various things that we've seen um, throughout our implementation uh, support with different customers and partners uh, in specific areas within the ESGM module and specific components to the foundation of setting up a successful ESGM program. Uh, and then towards the end, we'll answer any other questions that remain uh, and then do a wrap up. So from now uh, till the end of this agenda, it should take us roughly just slightly over an hour. Uh, so appreciate everyone's time and um, uh, interaction during this session. As well, um, just before we get into introductions, there will be three polls. Uh, so you'll see a poll come up shortly appreciate your ability to engage on that so that we can, um, you know, track some of those responses and see uh, where the percentages lie. So as I mentioned, my name is Jeremiah Brenner. I am uh, Principal Product Success Manager. I've been with uh, ServiceNow for over two years. Uh, I'm based out of Austin, Texas, um, and I've spent most of my career uh, of about 15 years uh, within the ESG, IT, and project management space and where those sort of um, thematics overlap um, and uh, have, have primarily been focused since I've been at ServiceNow on ESGM, um, getting us post sale support for our customers and our partners. Freedom. Thank you, Jeremiah. Hello, good morning, everyone. I am Freedom David. I am a principal business process consultant here at ServiceNow. I've been at ServiceNow for over two years. And I have about 10 years uh, of experience in management consulting as well as IT consulting. And uh, uh, prior to my role at ServiceNow, I was in management consulting and also working in the ESG world. I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm happy to be with everyone today and excited to share some of our learnings through our ESG management implementations. Thanks, Rita. So, We'll have our first poll that Freedom's going to launch here uh, related to your organization or your company's maturity level on ESG. Obviously, you, you know, it's up to your subjectivity on where you see this currently uh, related to your approach of uh, engaging in the ESG market or the ESG industry. And we're just going to do a quick poll to see where people are currently believe they're sitting. So if you can just take a few seconds to uh, respond to that, that would be great. So it looks like where we're coming in right now, uh, most folks are sort of sitting at the developing and intermediate level, which is great. We've got a few advanced um, participants as well. Uh, and then there's a few folks uh, sitting on the other end of the spectrum, which minimal interaction um, uh, or uh, maturity with ESG and then some not applicable or not sure. So totally fair, but it looks like the majority right now are intermediate. So that's and to be fair, that's where the developing intermediate is where I would say most organizations 
um, are, are at from what our uh, interactions are today. So I'll end the poll, um, share the results here, just so everybody can get a sense of what I was uh, referring to and we go from there, okay. So Freedom's gonna talk to us about why organizations are increasingly focused on ESG and the space that's evolving, uh, both from a reporting and data collection uh, component for their business and for their shareholders. So Freedom. Thanks, Jeremiah. So as many of you know, ESG is a hot topic for investors, corporate leaders, and the public, especially so in light of the, the last few years, right? Social unrest, worsening effects of climate change, and increased cyber attacks and ransomware. Right. So hand in hand with the growing ESG challenges, there are lots of ESG, mainly climate related regulations globally. And while many geographies are ahead of the US, history does show us that the US compliance landscape is influenced by what's happening in Europe. Uh, a recent development in the United States on March of this year is that the US SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, adopted the final rules that will require public companies to include extensive climate-related information in their registration statements and periodic reports. With all these developments in the ESG world, businesses are struggling to get their arms around ESG. For example, one thing we commonly see is data comes from all over the organization, and sometimes there's no one owner of ESG in the company, while at the same time, there are new requirements that are demanding more rigor in ESG reporting. So ServiceNow created ESG management, or ESGM for short, in order to help our customers get their arms around ESG. So together with some of our existing ServiceNow products, for example, integrated risk management or hardware asset management, ESGM can be a powerful tool to help you manage your data collection, tracking, and governance of your ESG data, your, your ESG initiatives, goals, and risk and controls. So over the next hour, we'll give you a quick overview of the ESGM application, and some key considerations when implementing ESGM. And before we dive into the application, let's have another quick poll. I'm gonna go ahead and launch. We should see another poll. So what are your primary, why are you primarily interested in the ESGM application? What is it that uh, you or your organization or your customers um, are particularly focused on at the moment. And it can be a variety of things, I'm sure. So uh, we'll give it a few seconds here. A lot of the focus right now is on regulatory compliance and risk management. You think a few answers still coming in here? Okay. I'm going to, if there's any last uh, submissions, I'm going to end the poll. Last call. Okay. And you can see here sort of uh, where some of this uh, thread is, the regulatory compliance and risk management, which is very common from what we hear from customers, uh, especially in parts of the world where regulations are already taking effect, um, you know, and, and especially in EMEA. Um, which is very regulated for ESG related uh, reporting and, and data management and tracking. So thank you, Dad. Thank you for that participation. Um, if we go on to the next section here, I'm going to talk briefly about the ESGM uh, application to provide some contextual framework around uh, when we get into the lessons learned uh, for those that aren't familiar with the application uh, or have seen under the hood a bit. So ESGM um, as a standalone application basically allows organizations to support materiality assessments, internal reviews, goal setting, um, apply that across the different areas of the business 
this creates metric definitions, metrics, and metric data, which feed into the application to create, you know, uh, for approvals, for validation, um, and that can be automated or manual, which then gets turned into disclosures uh, for reporting, uh, whether those are voluntary or uh, regulated. Um, and so helping you to set your goals, targets, align that with the business, get the right uh, stakeholders across the business to provide that information uh, through your metric data, and then turn that into a report uh, that you can put out to your uh, internal or external stakeholders. And as I was mentioning, just through a different lens, uh, there are different uh, stakeholders throughout the business that Freedom touched on as well. You know, we've got IT looking at through a different uh, perspective, supply chain, uh, procurement folks, customer service. They all have their sort of part of the real estate of ESG data. And so um, ESGM ap application allows you to create a common space for all of those data points and perspectives to be captured uh, and align with your strategic goals and targets. As well, just to quickly mention ESGM, um, has a uh, broader application with uh, two other products from ServiceNow, so the integrated risk management module and strategic portfolio management. So it allows you to create your goals and targets, collect your ESG data, help you manage your risk associated with all of that data that's being captured, tracked, and collated. And then what are the projects? How are we actually managing um, as an organization to achieve our goals and targets. So if we want to reduce carbon 10% for air travel, how are we doing that? What are the initiatives? Who's responsible? And that's where uh, SPM would come into play to help you um, assign some of that project management powerhouse behind the uh, goals and targets that you've set. Um, and then so preparing for an implementation um, where we've created now um, just to, to help contextualize where the next few minutes will go. Um, we will talk, talk very high level about what we've seen as what you think would be table stakes, but maybe are things to remind uh, implementers about um, around resources and change management. And then we'll get more specific into product related uh, items as well. Okay, so here we go. First off, ServiceNow, as you've probably seen with other products or modules, uh, provides a lot of resources so that our customers and our partners um, are able to uh, self-service uh, and pick up on best practices directly from the organization. Um, and it's no different with ESGM. The, the ESG space is constantly evolving. The product is constantly evolving. And as such, we provide um, updated resources for through webinars, through product documentation, through our ServiceNow ESG community, um, and now learning where we have training courses and certification courses to allow you, your end users, your implementers to get the most up-to-date and insightful information on how to be successful uh, in setting up, planning for, setting up, and rolling out ESGM. So I just want to highlight that, especially um, the ESGM success pack, which is something that allows you to take a full checklist to say from a project perspective uh, with all of your stakeholders, community, how are we, what are we thinking about how to roll this out? Have we thought about who needs to be involved uh, from a people process and technology perspective? It also gives you those lenses of, you know, getting ready, configuring, optimizing for your users or your use cases. And then what else can we do? What else can we do with the power of the platform from ServiceNow with some of our potentially existing ServiceNow products that have an ESG component uh, in terms of data? Um, and preparation for implementation is critical. So I'll let, uh, I'll let Freedom um, talk about this from in the field and working with some of our customers and partners. All right. So <clears throat> Jeremiah mentioned key resources from ServiceNow that can help make your implementation successful. So in this slide, we emphasize what you can do to prepare for a successful implementation within your organization. And there are plenty of things to do to prepare for implementation, right? So what we're doing here is we're highlighting common pitfalls we've seen in implementation that are directly controllable by your organization. <clears throat> so we'll start with the very first one, top left, involving stakeholders early. Uh, we common, commonly see business stakeholders 
who are going to be the super users of the software, not be involved in the sales process and demos. And this can cause a lot of issues, such as not getting buy-in early from these super users, these super users not understanding the solution and having unrealistic expectations for the product and the timeline uh, that their organization bought. Right? Since they are the ones who will use the solution and provide the requirements, make sure to involve them even in these early sales decisions and, and vetting of the product. Right? So pull in representatives from groups who will use the software early, include also the platform team if, for example, you already have service now implemented in your organization, and generally the IT team who will own the solution from a tech standpoint. So those who govern things like configuration and customization of your application. Um, so summarize, you know, have your stakeholders provide, who, who will be providing the requirements, understand what the organization is buying and why, uh, including understanding what they are getting with the software and the scope of the implementation package if they're purchasing implementation. Uh, the next one is starting with a goal in mind. This seems like project management 101, but it's so critical that it bears mentioning. So when you're, you're starting with a goal in mind, be clear on your priorities for your current implementation phase and what your priorities are not, right? So this is important because throughout the implementation, you'll get a lot of requirements from multiple users. If we don't keep our goals or the current phase in mind, it's very easy to spend time on work that does not align with your goals. So to keep your resources aligned to the value you want for your current phase, you need to keep your priorities top of mind. So your leaders should know your project members, your business users, and your third party, party partners if you have them. Uh, another thing to mention is uh, ServiceNow does a crawl, walk, run, fly maturity model, right, for most of our implementations. And one thing to keep in mind here is if you wanna, if you wanna fly, but you're currently in the crawl phase, that takes more time and resources, right? So you can't expect to grow from crawl to fly with minimal effort. Uh, also, it's very easy to blur the lines on what is MVP, versus what are interesting and exciting features that you can bring online. And while I love the excitement of adopting these, these um, all these capabilities, uh, you also wanna make sure to balance that, right? Because um, these interesting and, and exciting features can undermine the viability and schedule of your go live, right? So uh, again, Keep your goals in mind, uh, sequence your activities, right? You wanna make sure you activate the core first before you can leap into, in, in, into innovation. And then finally, when you're starting with a goal in mind, you, you wanna check in at the start of your implementation, right? Are there changes to your use case from the time you secure your product to the point you do your implementation. So we reconfirm your use cases, deliverables, et cetera, and make sure uh, it still aligns with your stakeholders. This is especially important for mega SKU buyers. And what I mean by that is if you're an organization that bought ESG management as part of uh, you know, a large buy of multiple applications, there, the buyer's um, uh, goals may not align with the goals of those who will actually e implement the ESG management application. So definitely check in. Uh, and of course, it's also important where ESG regulations are, are very quickly changing, especially in EU and APAC. Third one, take training. There is training available at our now learning for our ESG application, take it before implementation, right? The more familiar the users are with a solution before they start defining their requirements, the better and more specific requirements uh, will be. 
So you're going you're gonna to have to train anyway, right? So do it when it can also benefit your requirements gathering and so that you can eliminate any surprises in the uh, early in the process. Then who's gonna who's supposed to take the training, right? Uh, ensure that your super users and those who will give requirements during the workshops, as well as your hands-on keyboard developers, take the recommended service now training, so that they are familiar with what comes out of the box, and are better equipped to provide requirements. And one thing um, that I I wish people took advantage of more is that. Um, in uh, with ESG management training, there's usually a lab instance that you have access to. So, you know, use that lab instance in the training. You have a few days where it's active and there's a mechanism to request extensions. So you can use that to play around and be more familiar with your application. And then if you can, install ESGM in a non-production instance so that you your super users can start playing around with it as well. And while taking training, think about what needs to change in your process so that you can use the application out of the box, right? Because as you're taking training, you will get a preview of your future state processes. So you have the opportunity to start conceptualizing how you will align your data and processes to the future state. Which brings us to our fourth point on this slide, ready your data and processes, right? You'll have to change your processes with this new technology and you will need data to load into the system. So you wanna gather your current site documentation together, clean them up if possible so that you and your implementation team are armed with an understanding of your baseline and what will need to change in that baseline. Clean up your current state data, remove duplicates, achieve consistency, et cetera. The point here is you don't wanna take bad data into your new system. And then finally on this point, typically your implementers will give you an information request and questionnaire before your implementation workshops. So make sure to pay attention to these because it helps guide you on, uh, on, on requirements that you will be coming up during the implementation. Now the last two points, I won't belabor these too much, but project readiness and starting change management, right? There's a lot of guidance on project readiness and change management in, in, in our industries. So the point is, this uh, implementing a ESGM application is not just a change to your technology. It's a change to your processes. It's a change to the way of doing work. It's a, it's a big adjustment for everybody. So make sure you establish rigorous project management as well as change management on, uh, on your implementation. All right. So Jeremiah. I think you're next on this one. Yeah. Yeah. And just to, to pick, thanks, Freedom. So just to pick up on Freedom's comment, I mean, one thing we we see in some cases is that the change management component, um, it needs to be as fulsome, I would say, as what's being planned for the technolo technological uh, shift. So when you're moving off the uh, spreadsheets or you're moving off an existing point solution that does ESG data collection or reporting, and moving into service now, you know, how is that going to be packaged and um, prepared for the end users, which in many cases, dedicated ESG teams uh, in organizations are small groups. And so they are very pressed for time. Um, and then they also will need to train their end users who submit data uh, or own ESG data throughout the organization. So, you know, applying sort of the best practice change management approach when you're also looking at the technological side and getting resources to support that is very critical to get not only just um, a successful technological launch, but a successful adoption. Because um, we can have the greatest product in the world, um, but if folks aren't bought in, haven't done training, don't understand how to use the tool, you know, there's a loss in value and a loss in adoption. So that's something to, uh, to take seriously. And obviously when you're thinking about technological change, you know, if you're moving from 
um, a change over the next few months or you're, you have a longer strategy. Uh, some of it's tech centric. And then as you take longer time to, to do that for a business transformation perspective, six months to a year, you know, there's different approaches that and different stages that need to be in, uh, applied to involve those stakeholders from IT, business users, end users, et cetera, so that they're all aligned and on the same page. And, and lastly, the last point we'll make about this before we get to product specific is, um, and, and we talked about a little bit earlier, is all of the leaders and BUs within your business potentially look at ESG through different lenses. They have different concerns, different priorities, and different ways of doing things um, from data collection, uh, the types of data, the technology they're using, uh, depending on the organization's IT structure and how data is saved. So as you're bringing this group of individuals to the table to participate on an ESGM procurement uh, discussion or implementation discussion, you know, it, it's good to have sort of that multi-lens thinking and wear different hats to say, hey, what are your use cases and how is the product going to meet those use cases? Because someone who's a CFO will have completely different use cases in, some, um, in a majority of ways to what a CMO might have. So you need to make sure that those are all mapped accordingly based on um, business and business leader. And then this is the last bit here. Um, Freedom, you want to wrap this up and then we'll go into the product. Sure. So You've taken your training, right? Your initial stakeholders are defined. You've got your project and change readiness started. Now comes gathering your requirements. So here are some key items you want to keep in mind when you're gathering your requirements in general. So the very first is using the story structure. So think about your requirements from a story perspective, right? Who needs what requirement? And very importantly, why? This helps prioritize the requirements and help developers understand what is needed. The second prioritizing requirement goes back to what we mentioned earlier, right? Keeping the goals in mind. So prioritize the requirements based on the goals established in the early part of the implementation, right? What are your must haves versus nice to haves for your current phase? And the third is uh, rethink your data. Right? Define what data you want to capture in the future state and why, and also what data you don't need. Right? You may not want to collect the same data that you've put, been collecting previously, but then at, at the same time, you may now have the capability to collect data, collect important data that you that you were not collecting before. So. Definitely, you need to rethink your data. And then next is defining process changes. Adopting new technology means rethinking your current processes. So define process changes to support the future state. And if you want automation, you want repeatable logical processes, right? Keep exceptions to a minimum. And even, even exceptions should go through a repeatable logical exception process. And then finally, leveraging your developers, right? Um, so we commonly see during the requirements gathering, the developers not getting involved, mostly the business users providing requirements. So this is sometimes a missed opportunity in implementations. So leverage your developers as you gather your requirements. Uh, one way you can leverage your developers is to have them identify potentially high configuration requirements early and often so that you can prepare to make those hard decisions, right? If a requirement needs significant configuration or customization, is the business need enough to justify the technical debt your organization will take on? And when these high configuration requirements are identified, you wanna work with your developer on alternatives and communicate these potential alternatives to the business users, as well as the consequences if business users adopt these high configuration requests. The point is tech and business users need to work together to identify both process and technical adaptations so that 
you can minimize technical debt while at the same time uh, being able to use the application for your use case. Uh, and one thing uh, is we want to define what configurations and customizations, or excuse me, defining what configurations and customizations your organization will take on requires balance. You do want minimal technical debt, but some configurations and customizations may be needed. Uh, so start with why you need them. And if the business case does justify a customization, ensure that you have good governance around implementing and maintaining these configurations. And then another way you can leverage your developers is pull them into meetings where process decisions are being made that affect technology requirements. Right? This is so that your developers can advise earlier on what is possible with the technology rather than the business making decisions in a silo, presenting the approved solution to developers and expecting your developer not to push back. All right. Um, and then we're going to, as Jeremiah mentioned, we're going to go into the specifics of the application and our uh, key considerations there. Okay, so there's different components to ESGM. Um, thanks, Freedom, as well. And um, yeah, definitely having the right folks at the table uh, from if you're a ServiceNow customer, bring in your SN uh, platform folks who can advise you and engage you as a business user or as a representative of those, of those users on what's possible, what's high config, what's you know, a process-driven uh, change that you want to implement in ESGM that you're not doing today. And moving into ESGM is a great time. Uh, it's like moving houses. Great time to get rid of the clutter, pack up things that are important to you and start fresh. And that's, that's the same approach with moving into ESGM with your data and your processes and um, maybe even the people that engage uh, in that process. Um, so in roles uh, within the ESGM module, there are predefined roles uh, that can be assigned to different users um, and set up as groups uh, to allow those users to have different flexibility usage and controls within the module. I'm not going through all the, uh, the checklist items here, but typically the roles are administrator, program manager, Reporting and Disclosure Manager, the Metrics Manager, uh, ESG Data Owner, and if you're using um, an ESG Risk uh, Management component, then you've got an ESG Risk Manager. And each of these roles, uh, you can see on the product docs, if you'd like, um, have access to different tables, different uh, permission levels, and are able to do different things, essentially, within the product. And so as you're planning for an implementation and looking at the stakeholder list from your customer, or your internal users, you know, defining who needs what access based on the roles and what personas line up with each of those individuals is a really important exercise to have. Uh, and Freedom's going to talk about some of the learnings we've seen um, over the last two years of implementations on this topic. Right. So Jeremiah mentioned um, aligning your people with these out-of-box roles. So here's a typical process of how you would do that. The very first is identifying your key personas right, in your process. So some common ones will be, of course, your technical administrator, your business owners who own the application from a business perspective, your data providers who could be different from the business owners, as well as approvers and leadership. Right? So as you're defining these common personas, also identify if they differ for certain ent entities. For example, um, your data providers for specific locations could be, uh, for a specific country could be different for another country. Right? And, and then after you've identified your key personas, map them against out of the box rules, which Jeremiah mentioned earlier. And the third is, if there are key personas who work in the application who are not covered by out of the box roles, think about what kind of access they need. And before you start creating custom roles or custom ACLs for these key personas, think about if these access gaps are covered by other solutions 
for example, it maybe the business need could be covered by security groups, filters, or reports. So try to avoid custom rules because it seems simple to create those, but the back end to secure all the different tables and form access is fairly arduous. And uh, it's just gonna bite you more and more every time you uh, you upgrade and, and uh, the application grows and new tables are added. All right, so that's on user groups and roles. Now that you've mapped your roles, let's talk about ESGS um, specific objects and the typical implementation sequence for these. So ideally, you start with your materiality assessment, which is done outside of the application. Um, from your mat materiality assessment, you identify your material topics and load them into ESGM. You can load your frameworks as authority documents and citations. We have some frameworks that, and citations that come out of the box, such as SASB, GRI, UNSDG, and, and more are coming uh, every almost every upgrade. You then establish your goals and sub goals or load goals that are already underway in your organization and map them to your material topics. You can then map your more specific targets under goals and then establish your entity framework. We'll go more a little bit, we'll go a little bit more into entities in a few more slides. You establish your metric definitions, which are essentially your, your templates for what data you wanna collect. Uh, and then you start collecting data with your metrics. And finally, once you've collected your data, you generally, you generate your disclosures, whether these are reports or word documents. So ESGM is designed to help you manage your ESG program from end to end, but depending on your use case, not all of these features uh, are necessary, right? So we have seen customers sometimes just for their phase one, for example, just focus on the data collection piece and their, their goals and targets are tackled on a next phase, right? Uh, so it's, it's a fairly flexible application and you can kind of pick and choose which ones you, you, are, you implement for your specific phase. Okay. Thanks, so, Rina. so, yeah, so now we're going to talk material topics, uh, goals, and targets in sort of the hierarchy that we were discussing. So material topics, typically organizations will do materiality assessment, um, sometimes leveraging third parties to say, where where's the biggest risk or impact from our business from an ESG perspective? Um, and, you know, to start that off, you'll classify those topics as this is an environmental risk, such as climate and energy, is it a social risk uh, or social topics such as community involvement, how important is it to the business and how important is, a, is it to our stakeholders? And you've defined who those stakeholders are so you have a good sampling. From there within the product, uh, you can classify all of these as specific items, get them approved, and then you also have access to a heat map to say, okay, Right now, our material topic lists are pretty high uh, from a concern or risk perspective and, you know, importance to the business on economic impacts and business principles. So there's a lot showing up in this right top right quadrant where some other things, um, you know, on the community side, supply chain, it's a little less, um, uh, a, it's a little less uh, important to our stakeholders, but it's fairly important to our business. So it gives you a sense of visualization of how all these topics uh, pan out, which then ties into how you want to set some of your goals. Um, now, you don't have to have material topics to set goals if you haven't done a materiality assessment uh, or if that's something that you're planning to do down the line. Goals can be related to anything within your ESG program, uh, pre-existing or that has net to be defined with the team. Um, and basically saying of the E, S, and G, what are we trying to do with this program, right? So how does this align to our strategy as a company, as a business, 
as a ESG group or department or uh, council. Um, you know, and here you'll see some examples of uh, accelerate decarbonization um, and with some sub goals, net zero supply, uh, supply chain with GHG emissions, et cetera, right? And so the goals give you sort of the North Star that you want to work toward, uh, which then help also set targets, right? So underneath your goals, uh, you can set targets uh, related to specific components of the ESG bucket. Um, you can figure out what state they're in, who's the owner, start date, end dates, et cetera. And how you're going to be relating those targets is also going to be tied to your metric data. Um, and so all of that gets compiled if you're, uh, for instance, an ESG program manager persona um, and you want to see a dashboard. This is one of the out-of-the-box dashboards that you would see where uh, you're getting an overview of your material topics. You're getting quick actions for if you need to create a goal or a target. Um, you're seeing some top-level goal summary that's uh, you know, been approved or created or what state they're in, uh, and then target by each goal that you've uh, assigned. If you have disclosures in play, so you're working on something for SASB, you're working on something for GRI, uh, and you know you have you know, six of 10 that need to be done, um, tracking those, um, and then what's outstanding. And then you've ultimately got your materiality, uh, material topics heat map at the bottom here. And ultimately, just to summarize, so you're looking at goals, your data collection, projects and programs related to those goals, uh, the risk to achieving those goals, disclosure requests, and then uh, material topics and their impact. So that's just contextualizing what you would see in product um, out of the box related to those sort of foundational components of the module. And Freedom's going to talk about um, some things that we've seen and learned um, over the last two years of implementation. Great. So as Jeremiah mentioned, um, he described how you can leverage these material topics, goals, and targets in the ESGM application. So I'll talk about some key considerations when you're bringing in these data into the application. So the first one is hierarchy, right? Uh, material topics, for material topics, goals, and targets, there is a hierarchy in the application, specifically ESG classification first, which is your environmental, social, and then governance. And then your material topics, then your goals, then your targets. Ideally, you use this hierarchy when you bring your data in. Now, not everyone uses the words environmental, social, or governance. So these ESG classifications are configurable so that they can align with the terminology and number of terms that your organization uses. For example, it could be, you know, caring for our planet rather than environmental or supporting our communities rather than social. And then uh, targets allow you to try, uh, are, are related to metric definitions and metrics, which are your individual data points. So this helps you to automatically track completion based on these metrics. Uh, it's a neat feature to consider. So think about how you wanna map your metrics to targets as you're moving your targets into the ESGM application. And then goals are related to various objects, right? So just material topics, framework citations, entities, et cetera. The idea is that you can use these hierarchies to organize your data within the application. However, in the real world, we know that these data are not always tied to goals, right? You may be tracking something because a customer has requested it, but it may not really be material to your organization um, or for some other reason, right? So although you have the capability to tie things together in the hierarchy, they don't always have to be tied together. All right. So go next ahead. we're gonna, go ahead. So, so next we're going to be talking about metrics, metric definitions, entities, and data units, which are the next level of the foundational elements of the ESGM. So um, right now, how you source metrics from within the ServiceNow platform, third-party tools, et cetera, um, there's a couple ways to do this. So we can pull data from existing uh, products, potentially, if you're using uh, different ES, um, ServiceNow products that have ESG data that you're trying to pull into a metric definition. 
uh, as well as external systems, so third-party system integrations, which we'll we'll talk about in the list view later. Um, all, obviously, you can create that to be automated data collection, which will flow into ESGM. I think the goal of anyone um, doing data collection is to automate it as much as possible, um, whether that's today or you know with AI heavily being invested in by service now, you know what that would look like from a prompt um, and response perspective. As well, there's manual data entry. So this is where data owners have the opportunity in a spreadsheet like view, which will show within the UI to say, you know, I'm responsible for this facility's, um, you know, utility bill uh, for the last year. And they can manually, if they don't get um, automated bills and things are mailed or whatever, and they don't want to use OCR, they can manually enter that data for each month or each year, whatever the, the definition is within the metric. Um, into the system. So you've got different ways of doing this and it's really up to you to sort of pick your menu of choices of how much effort do you want to put into automation versus the manual data entry and the load between those two uh, components. Uh, a typical flow, uh, which is, you know, standard, I would say, is um, when you're coming from the ESG reporting manager, um, they're launching metric data collection tasks. So this is how they collect the metric data from the data owners. And at that point, hopefully the data owners are trained. They know why they're being asked to do something. They understand the emails. They understand how to, to submit the data. Uh, that goes out. You'll see here the data provider. Uh, there's a few things that they need to do manually. And then there's a few things coming from the system that are automated that will populate the metric data and pull from you know, any uh, APIs or spokes uh, for third parties. That then goes back up to the ESG metrics or ESG program manager to say, hey, we've got a whole list of data submitted from across the business or for third parties from suppliers, you know, whoever your state, uh, stakeholders are. Does this data make sense? Does it look good based on trending, based on what we've seen in the past? Um, does something look out of whack? And then they can ultimately approve or reject that data and send it back uh, to the data submitter. From there, if you're focused on GHG, for instance, uh, you can run carbon accounting and other calculations to, uh, you know, using emission factors or whatever you're looking to do uh, to create your um, ESG footprint and uh, portfolio, and then ultimately turn that into your disclosure report. That would go to the reporting manager if you had that persona, and then ultimately probably go to some kind of creative agency to get that published or included in a 10K or, um, you know, some compliance level report. Uh, framework. Um, something else within the tool that not, I'm not sure the familiarity is around calculated metric definitions. So there is a formula builder within uh, ServiceNow DSGM um, application out of the box where you basically can create your own formulas for, um, for your metrics. So basically, you know, in this example, they're looking at total employees by gender, which they know uh, they want to capture that identify as female divided by the number of total employees to get that calculation. Fairly straightforward, but you can build fairly complex formulas in here to get you, uh, you know, spend-based data to get you a, 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 with an emission factor to get you the equivalent carbon, um, you know, whatever the flavor is that you need for scope one, scope two, scope three. Uh, on the E side of things, you know, the formula builder can do that. Uh, as well, you're gonna get visibility within the, plot, the, the product to see the dashboards, right? So in the top left, you're gonna see, uh, depending on your persona and, and you know, if you're an EG, ESG program manager or someone who has to submit data, you know, how many metrics, how many tasks do I have open right now? This person has 45, so that means I have 45 things I need to complete related to this cycle of data submission. Um, and then you can also break it down by different locations. Um, and if you happen to uh, take advantage of the sustainable IT components uh, add-in for ESGM that works with HAM, Hardware Asset Management, um, you can then create sustainable IT dashboards around procurement, tracking of resources and disposal um, for your ESG asset, uh, your uh, IT asset. And uh, last section here, I think, is um, when you're looking at the metrics and metric definitions, We've talked about, okay, there's automated and there's manual ways of collecting data. Now you've, you know, basically put that into the, the product. Um, you know, you can do rollups, you can do emission conversions, you can do uh, ad hoc or periodic metrics that will just run on, this, on the cycle that you need them to run. 
And then you can go in and do a 360 view uh, to visualize any data dependencies uh, and how they might interact with some of your goals and targets. So in the bottom left here, you'll see, okay, there's three metric definitions uh, associated with this. There's this many citations, how many controls if you're looking at risk, right? So there's 284 controls tied to six goals. It gives you sort of that full pie chart view of how these um, are all connected. And then something to segue into the next topic, when you're created a metric, uh, when, you're, when you're collecting metrics, metric data tasks um, ultimately need to be tied to some kind of an entity, right? To say, how are we, what are we doing with this data and what entities are we applying them to? And so uh, just as an example of entities, and then I'll hand it over to Freedom. Entities could be people, places, objects, things that need to be monitored in order to manage your risks uh, and track any kind of com controls and compliance. So this is a very high level, simple example uh, of an entity type and example entity. So the type is region, country, department, supplier, utilities. The entities themselves then become underneath that type, North America, Central America, Asia, et cetera. And then obviously that parent level, you can go child level uh, entities and you know break it down by, um, you know in this case, which they've sort of done here, country, uh, department, supplier, utilities, and you could go down to building, you know, business unit, et cetera. So these are the ways that we tie sort of metric data back to what are, what are we, so we can, Say, what are we measuring this against? Where is this coming from? Which allows you then to track your progress and uh, goals and targets. And then I'm gonna hand this over to Freedom to, to pick this up here. All right. So let's talk about some key considerations when you're setting up your metric definitions during implementation. The very first is matching your metric definition type to the collection method. Right? Uh, we mentioned three types of metric definitions. You've got your automated versus manual versus calculated. Automated is typically used to capture data from ServiceNow tables and leverage it to, and, and it is leveraged for some pre-built integrations as well. Manual is what you use to collect data directly from users or groups of users. And it has an approval workflow out of the box. And then calculated, uh, Jeremiah mentioned a lot of uh, examples for how you'd use calculated metric definitions, but essentially it's used to leverage other metrics and metric definition data into whatever calculation you need. And then the second is modeling calculations in the application early. Right? This is so that you can test early if the way you've structured your metrics and your metric definitions as well as entities will work with the calculations you have in mind. And then third one is using ServiceNow platform reporting capability, not just your metric definitions, right? So for example, instead of using a calculated metric definition to calculate percentage, there are actually reports that can help you uh, calculate that without necessarily using metric definitions. And then the first, the fourth one there is using content accelerators and integrations, right? Make your life easier. Use content accelerators because some of these have predefined metric definitions, right? And you want to leverage uh, pre-existing data integrations from, from our partners. Uh, <clears throat> even if you end up not using your metric definitions immediately from, from the content accelerators, you can load them as an active so that you have a library of metric definitions that you can, you can reference. Okay. And then uh, one of the common configurations we've seen is a way for new metric definitions to be accepted into the ESGM application. So currently, there's no metric definition approval workflow to accept new metric definitions. And we know that every organization has different ways of managing new metric definitions they wanna keep track of. So if you have an approval process you wanna adopt, then make sure you have your specific requirements around this. And then the last one is 
you want to consider implications of structuring metric definitions against your entities, right? So some license counts, so, some ESG management license uh, count your active metric definitions. So think about how you structure these so that you abide by uh, your license um, licenses that you bought or that you buy the appropriate number of licenses. And then, um, as we heard, right, metric definitions have to go hand in hand with entities. So entities are another very important component of your implementation. There's lots of content in this slide, so I'll pick a few to expand on uh, in the interest of time. So first is understanding your organizational needs in the context of ESG management, right? Um, so in ESGM, entities are very important to for defining what you will pair against your metric definitions. So before create, creating entity structures, it's crucial to thoroughly understand the specific ESG goals and reporting needs of your organization. This includes knowing what data is most relevant, how it will be collected, and who will be responsible for managing it. So think about what objects you collect ESG data against or report ESG data against. Could be locations, departments, meters, dumpsters, third-party companies, et cetera. And another item I wanted to highlight is, is using hierarchy and relationships when you're setting up these entities. So you want to define a clear hierarchy and relationship between the different entities, right? This could include relationships between various departments, locations, and other organizational units that impact ESG reporting. So this is so that you can ensure that data rolls up correctly and that reports generated provide an accurate picture of the organization's ESG performance. Now, setting up hierarchies is especially important for locations since the application uses this location hierarchy to map emission factors to the appropriate locations. Okay. So even if you don't do the hierarchy for any of your other entities, at least do it for your locations. And then the final thing I want, uh, well, another one I wanted to highlight on this slide is integration with other systems, right? Uh, consider how the ESGM entity structures will integrate with other systems in use, such as HR, finance, and operations management systems. Effective integration ensures seamless data flow and reduces the need for manual data entry, right? So when we talk about integrations in this case, we talk about using some of your common service now tables like locations, companies, departments. So use entity types and entity filters over one-off entities so that you can uh, use automate create, uh, you can automate creation of entities based on certain criteria. So if you're already an IRM application user, then you, you know how important these entity filters are. And also keep in mind as that entities are shared with integrated risk management application. So if you wanna take advantage of that integration and track your risks and controls for your ESG entities, uh, you wanna uh, try to as much as possible use these same or common entities across these different applications. And then finally, regular reviews and updates, right? ESG priorities and regulations can evolve. So you wanna regularly review and update the entity structure as needed so that you can ensure ongoing compliance and relevance in your ESG reporting efforts. Then finally, units. Um, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'm not gonna go into this too much because it can get a little technical. Um, we included units in this section because you define your units in the metric definition. And these are just some key considerations when you're using units in the application. Some of these may seem fairly obvious, but uh, if you miss them, it can be painful to backtrack, right? Um, so we'll, we'll leave this slide for you to 
keep in your back pocket as you're implementing, but I'm not gonna go into this. this these are hopefully fairly self-explanatory just to save on time. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Freedom. Um, so I, I mentioned the UI dashboard that's very um, spreadsheet-like uh, earlier on. And so this is where you would see um, you know, an example of uh, data entry based on different entity uh, locations or uh, however this is defined by the user. Um, and you'll be submitting data in this spreadsheet style uh, if you're doing some of the data entry. And you'll see on the right side here, you'll see, okay, what's the entity? When did it start? What's the end date? What's the due date? Um, there's also instructions that you can add at the bottom in the dialog box. And then you can include links um, or uh, attachments that are related to the metric data that's been submitted. So if you had a PDF uh, or if there was some report that you wanted to leverage to support what's been submitted, um, you can add that as well. Um, and, and, and data obviously is the main heart of, of this whole exercise, right? And so we talked about, uh, you know, automated manual and calculated metric definition. Through bulk data imports, that's another option to bring large data sets into the product. Um, you can use an import template, craft it with the data that you may have been capturing or your customers or, or your users may have been capturing in a spreadsheet, put it into the template and bring it into uh, the ESGM module. Uh, you can do um, use integration hub uh, with that. I think there's about 200 plus and growing uh, connectors that will help connect the system and bring that into ESGM. And we also have a number of plugins that I'll talk about in a second um, and third-party apps that support that exercise. Obviously, if you're familiar with ServiceNow, you know AI is very top of mind and that's no exception when it comes to ESGM. Um, the inbound product team and engineering is looking at aggressively how to include AI into uh, the roadmap in a fairly short order which will help with document intelligence, reading, uh, you know, key components of that documentation, um, maybe recreating a report um, with a few caveats so that there's not a lot of manual sort of rework. Um, that's all sort of in process and, and development at the moment. Um, and then when you have package content, and so with the SGM, you do have access to the content accelerator, uh, which I think there's a module slide I'll, that I'll show in a second. Um, that is maintained content by ServiceNow, uh, and that aligns with uh, on you know growing frameworks and standards. So we've got sustainableit.org, we've got uh, GRI, SASB, CSRD. Um, those are all right now in product um, that come with 6,300 citations and 2,800 predefined metric definitions. Um, so that you don't have to go and create that metric definition. It's already out of the box. You just have to assign it what's the metric data you're trying to capture for that and from who, and then put that in motion. Um, and then we have a mission factor content packs as well that it can be uh, supplied. Um, and this will continue to grow within the products through the content accelerator style uh, application uh, where different uh, organizations that provide emission factors will be refreshed and available for customers to use at their discretion. Uh, and then lastly, we've got um, partner-based solutions from the ServiceNow store that will help with any sort of manner of data collection and data review for internal or suppliers um, that you can also add in onto ESGM as well. This is a quick view of the content accelerator pack. So if you installed this uh, with your version of ESGM, the latest version from uh, March, um, you're gonna see you know, ESRS or CSRD, some of the frameworks that I mentioned here. All you have to do is activate them uh, update them with whatever year you're looking to report against uh, with the latest framework, with the latest um, reporting from those organizations, and then apply them with the preset metric definitions to your uh, program. Um, and then quickly on metric data integrations, these are ones that we work with closely, sort of on a, a more consistent basis, Arcadia. Uh, so they actually are one of our third party uh, partners that provides um, basically automated utility data aggregation and feeding it into ESGM. So if you've got PDF bills uh, for different tenants, the metering bills, all that kind of thing, their product uh, will do OCR, read through those uh, data points, pick out what it needs to pick out from your meters and from your bills, and all centralize that into ESGM based on your metric definition. Uh, 
And we've done that with a few customers now um, who fairly, I think, found value out of that experience. Watershed uh, plugin as well, Workday, where you're looking at HR data, you know, DEI, compensation, et cetera. And then SAP uh, Concur specifically around travel data uh, for scope three emissions. Um, so quickly on the data upload process, because this is a topic that has come up quite frequently for, let's say, more of the intermediate to advanced customers that have been doing ESG data collection for a while. Yeah. So as Jeremiah mentioned, this can be fairly technical. So even though I'll go through this, this is likely more appropriate for you to keep in mind when you're actually doing your historical data upload, right? So there, um, some, some quick points here. First, you wanna define your data to import. And when you're, when you're doing that, that um, you wanna make sure that you're capturing just the data that you want in your future state, right? Uh, you wanna make sure that your data is clean, right? Um, remove even the things like extra spaces there at the end of names, et cetera. Uh, ensure that you have the minimum columns available and I've I've defined that in the in the slide. Uh, you want to make sure that your your state is completed because the expectation is that the data that you're loading has already gone through the approval processes outside of service now which because it's historical data, right? And then after you've you've defined your data, cleaned up your data, you want to then import your data into the instance. Very importantly, you want to put metrics in place in your instance. Uh, to receive the historical data that you're going to imp import and ensure that you are in the GRC metrics application scope. Otherwise, you will not be able to import to the metric data pick table. And then uh, there are a few more details there that I'm not going to uh, go into. The third item is checking expected outcomes. So you want to make sure that once you've done steps one and two, that past data shows up in the ESG workspace, certain auto-populated fields are, uh, are have been auto-populated with uh, based on the historical data that you uploaded and aggregations and calculations using data from past dates work after appropriate scheduled jobs run. So, so um, everything that we've been talking about is more or less process, preparation, planning, then doing, leading to data collection, data entry, user setup, roles, all that. For many organizations that we work with, the ultimate goal here besides the dashboards and just keeping a finger on the pulse of their ESG program uh, is around reporting. And so again, those reporting uh, uh, outputs could be for internal purposes, they could be part of an annual uh, ESG or sustainability report, they could be a part of regulatory reporting. Everything that, especially in today's, let's say more shifting toward regulatory, um, you know, thematic for reporting, the key things that go into your report, uh, data is getting to the point where it's, it's probably going to be almost I could see it happening in in the next few years that they're going to be looking for SOX compliant auditable data for ESG. So creating a report is great, but how accurate is that data? Can it be audited? Can an auditor come in and go right back from start to finish of where that data was submitted, approved, reviewed, uh, sourced, everything? So the G is a very big component of ESG right now, I would say, and that's where ServiceNow is great uh, for the ESG module in terms of how the tracking, the timestamps, and you know exactly uh, giving options for um, auditors to go in and see where you know all this data has been um, collated. But ultimately, what you want to do, assuming your data is good, assuming everything's gone through the right processes with legal and um, you know risk teams at your organization, ultimately it's the reporting side, right? And so ServiceNow leverages the power of Office 365 to create those reports. Uh, so we have a plugin with Office 365 that allows users to pull live data from ESGM into the product, uh, into the Word doc. Um, and this Word doc then gives you all the functionality and all the capabilities that Office 
uh, comes with. And so, you know, you can manipulate charts, manipulate feel and look. People can come in and, you know, contribute their qualitative uh, uh, narrative discussion submissions with each of the data points. And as let's assume data needed to be refreshed or updated, you can refresh the data in the plugin, which will then update the charts uh, with whatever's the latest in the product. And from there, I mean, you're, you're, you can set up processes within your organization to say, level one review happens today, goes to SharePoint, or sorry, goes to OneDrive. Um, we're moving on to the next group of uh, reviewers, and then they go into OneDrive to do that. Um, and once that's through the cycle, most in most cases, when we work with customers, whatever they've created in Word or, you know, some non PDF version of the, the report that then goes to a creative agency that will, you know, uh, beautify it and, and make it look a little more engaging Add videos and things like that. So this is really the, the almost last step before it would go to that creative agency, um, to make sure that you've hit all the marks with your, if you're doing a SASB report, all your SASB data is in there. It's formatted with the way that you want it. And you may have pulled data from previous reports into, um, into this Word doc, which becomes that central repository. And there are some key considerations and learnings that we've we've experienced with this uh, with this plugin um, integration setup. So first off, make sure that um, if you're looking to do this with your customers or with uh, your end users, that you talk to your IT teams or ServiceNow platform teams. A lot of times within IT, there's ownership over Office 365 and which plugins and how things can be saved. With Office 365, you have the ability for remote storage. So you can download, upload, download, upload the report uh, and control the versioning. In a more ideal state, that's why we've offered the option to sync with OneDrive so it's in real time. Um, but depending on the organization, they might not, uh, there might be permissions based issues around OneDrive. We have also come up with ways to use SharePoint itself um, to do that. So just make sure that you know, when you're doing your vetting, that that's part of the discussion. Data synchronization, um, data changes all the time, as we mentioned. Um, if you have automated data tasks running um, at certain cycles, monthly or uh, weekly, whatever the cycle may be, it's good to say, okay, when is the cutoff for the data that we want to pull into this report uh, so that the data automation or things that are running in the background doesn't get pulled in, that doesn't, you know, it's not part of the scope. Uh, so just keeping that in mind that if you're refreshing data from the product into uh, Office 365, that you've completed that reporting cycle and there isn't anything running in the background that as your review goes for a month or two months might change the data in a way that you don't want it to. Uh, Office 365 obviously offers a lot of collaboration features. I mean, that's the intent is folks to co-collaborate in the document and change and, and manipulate the look and feel of that document as needed. Talked about workflow automations a bit. So just monitoring what's going in and how often things are running before you refresh the data set to, to make sure you've captured exactly what you want to capture. Uh, reporting and analytics. Um, you know, we talked about a little bit the charts and the graphs and things like that. Um, you know, those can all be uh, updated and edited based on what you need for colors and adding aliases if you don't want to showcase a certain um, location name or address name based on the metric definition name that you're using in the product. That's all something that can be configured uh, quite easily. Um, as well, training and support, there are a lot of webinar content and some extras on now learning about setting up Office 365, the initial plugin install with the manifest that gets pulled into um, the, the tool and, and then support going forward. So three things, ServiceNow community, webinars, um, and the extras of now learning. And if you're having any issues, you can always open a now support uh, case ticket and someone from product eng will get involved. And then the last two things, change management has been a common thread through, I think, throughout this whole presentation. As we said, we assume for most organizations or implementers, this is table stakes, but it is so core to getting folks who are used to doing things a certain way uh, in a point solution or proprietary solution, or, you know, we've always done it this way and it works. If they're moving toward this kind of a feature uh, with like with Office 365, what are their requirements? What are the capabilities of the, of the plugin? 
And then is there any disparity between those requirements and how much of that needs to be configured as, or versus out of the box? If you have that honest and transparent conversation, you're definitely going to be setting yourselves up for success uh, and managing, um, you know, any risks associated with uh, timelines for reporting and people saying, you know, we need to get reports done ASAP. Um, you know, give yourself enough runway to test this out with users to say, yes, this meets our requirements. There's nuances here that we figured out. And, and now we're, we're not up against the wall to try to crank out a report really quickly. And then regular updates and maintenance, I would say this is more so for the IT team. You know, Office 365, ESGM constantly being updated and uh, changed with new versions. And so, like any other product, uh, your IT will just need to manage that. If something's getting uploaded into a new version of 365, um, that there aren't any potential breakages with what's being provided by uh, ESGM from ServiceNow. So that is a lot of information that we've gone through in a very short window. Um, and we've sort of just scratched the surface of some of the uh, in-product and uh, third-party sort of uh, data collection, integration, and support, and lessons learned that we've seen with different partners and customers. Um, at the end of this, we wanted to do another poll just to see, so after this session and what you've seen today, uh, what do you see is primarily the benefits uh, of the module and some of these lessons learned for your organization or your customers. And I think there's multiple choice here, so you're able to choose a bit more. So we'll leave this open for maybe 15 seconds, give folks a chance to, uh, to click in. It looks like improved reporting capabilities is fairly high, data accuracy, time management of ESG data collection. Yeah. Improved reporting capabilities is still the highest uh, with time management and data accuracy being sort of the second uh, components to this in terms of uh, benefits. So I'll give everyone five more seconds. I'll wrap this up. Okay, so again, what we've seen here based on what you and what you've experienced in the webinar re enhanced reporting capabilities efficient time management of data collection and then enhanced data accuracy seem to be the core driver uh, of the benefits that you would want to realize with the sgm followed by better stakeholder collaboration and then ultimately uh, it technical efficiencies by having a platform-based solution versus a point solution um, that would do the same thing but you know, is, is a different set of use cases than a platform product. Okay, so with that, uh, I'm not sure where we're at with time and if there's any questions left. Uh, first off, before we get into any questions, wanted to very much thank you uh, for taking the time to participate in this webinar today. Um, there will be a poll after the survey uh, just to assess, you know, was this a, a good use of your time? Is there anything you'd like to see in the future? That kind of thing. Uh, that's optional for you to fill out. But if you do fill it out, any of that helps us to tailor our webinars going forward and make them a more valuable experience for our guests and our customers. Uh, so thank you very much for attending. Let me just see here, uh, see some stuff popping up in the Q&A. So thank you very much. Um, good content. I see we've answered a few questions. Yeah, and I would also say if you're interested in things that you've seen here today or want to do a deep dive uh, into with uh, with, with myself or someone from the product team that represents this, please do re reach out, um, you know, post, post uh, in the survey uh, or reach out to me directly, especially around sustainable IT, because that is a fairly new, uh, you know, six months or so, uh, a fairly new add-in for ESGM, but we're getting a lot of interest and traction uh, with CIOs and IT teams around um, asset management uh, and ESG, uh, GHG tracking for those resources uh, and the full life cycle of procurement use and then end of use. So fairly new use case uh, for us. Um, but it looks like all the questions have been answered. I'll give folks back a few minutes. Uh, thank you, Freedom. Anything you wanna say before we wrap up? No, just thank you again for attending and uh, let's continue this conversation, right? If you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to Jeremiah um, and myself as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you have the ServiceNow community uh, to post questions as well, as well as the developer community. I'm not sure if folks know about that, but if you have 
specific uh, coding, scripting, you know, uh, configuration questions, the developer community, you post something, you'll get a response from an engineer fairly quickly. So that's something else if you, you really want to dig in under the hood of, of ESGM as well. So thank you very much again. We look forward to uh, seeing you in future sessions. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, have a great week. Thank you.